Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, for those that are new to Ned Talks, uh, it is a very relaxed platform for conversation. Uh, it's as interactive as, as possible. Uh, these sessions are always much better when it's not just um, the people that are leading the conversation. We have uh, Steve Lawless, uh, who is the managing partner at uh, Salus Life International. We have my colleague, Adrian Crow. Uh, he's our senior wealth planner in the London office um, at Nedbank. And in terms of topics today, we're continuing with the discussion around the changes or the potential changes to the uh, Resnon Dom legislation. Um, and, and what we're looking at today is uh, how or whether or how life assurance can be used as a bit of a, as a, a to provide a bit of certainty when everything is up in the air. So um, the impact of the potential changes, what that means for uh, people's inheritance tax liabilities is unknown at the moment. So in terms of what we're going to do, we are going to talk about what the rules look like now what they have been suggested they may be by both leading parties. Um, and then probably the bulk of it uh, is Steve talking about the nuances of life assurance. Uh, we all understand what it means in its sort of basic concept, but but actually there's some practical things that make it slightly, uh, other than the nuances that, about it that's probably worth knowing. Um, okay. Right, so I'll stop talking. Um, by the way, it is very relaxed. If you have any questions, please just either put your hand up, shout them out, drop me a message, um, but don't hold back, please. Uh, I'll hand over to Adrian. I think he's just going to give a bit of a, uh, an overview of where we are now. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, I really don't want to keep this a more than a couple, uh, take more than a couple of minutes to talk about the, the non-DOM rules in terms of where we are and we've been, because I don't know about anybody else, but I feel um, slightly non-DOMed out uh, because we've been talking about nothing else since probably um, March. Um, and I'm sure most people on the, on the call today are familiar with where we are today and all of the various things that have been suggested and mooted um, that will come into effect us from April next year. So, but just as a recap, and, and in particular focusing on inheritance tax, um, a UK resident and non-domicile, of course, will become subject to UK inheritance tax on any UK CITES assets that they own upon coming to the UK, or even before then potentially as well. Um, and once they've been resident in the UK, they will become subject to UK inheritance tax on their worldwide estate, um, subject to any planning or trust planning that they do, of course, as well. Um, and so those are issues in themselves that, that need addressing. Um, if somebody was likely to leave the UK at any point in time, having become deemed domicile, there's also this the 15 of 20 year rule. So you've almost got that tax tail um, at the end on leaving the UK where you need to be outside of, of the UK for at least five years in order to, to lose that domicile, the domicile status. Um, the rules as they are that we think, depending on whoever gets in charge us from April 25, are that um, you won't be subject to UK inheritance tax until you've been resident in the UK um, on your worldwide estate for 10 years rather than 15. But also that tail of five years as it is at the moment will extend out to being 10 years potentially as well. Um, it would be quite nice to, to get people's thoughts actually on that, on how that's going to be policed, because I, I'm, I'm not sure personally. Um, so, so that would be a, an interesting point to cover. But I, I think what we can show is that in terms of inheritance tax, whatever the rules are, whether there's rules now um, or rules later, you've got an immediate liability to inheritance tax in the UK on UK CITES assets. And there will be an inheritance tax liability that could potentially last for longer um, if the new rules come in, as we think that they might do. Um, but it's all relatively uncertain, and we don't quite know what's going to happen. 
And so that's very difficult for individuals to plan for. Um, and in terms of making a long term plan, that's not something that happens overnight. It's not even something that necessarily happens over the course of months. And so I think what we see very often is that life assurance can provide that period of time where you know your inheritance tax liability is provided for um, during the period of the the period of time that you're trying to make that plan. So it's buying you time um, in what can be actually a relatively, certainly compared to um, the costs associated with the remittance basis and, and establishing any longer term structures as well that you may or may not need. It's a relatively low cost solution for a specific period of time. Of course, if you're if you're looking to stay in the UK permanently, then there are longer term solutions. But what I'm trying to focus on is that short term period of uncertainty when you don't know what the rules are or you don't know what you're going to do. Quick question. Uh, and I'm I'm very happy to answer what a lot of people might consider silly questions. Um, if they do bring changes in that affect the current, uh, well, they will. Um, what are the chances of them backdating? Who knows? Good. <laughs> Basically, more, more does anybody else know? More, more certainty. <laughs> does anyone have a feel on whether they will backdate anything? Um, I'll start picking on people eventually. Um, uh, does, it, yeah, does anyone have a view on that? I've heard a few people starting to ask about it, um, sort of anti forestalling rules. I think the big question is timing because yeah. if, the, if if the Labour Party win an election and, and have got enough time to um, think about these rules and get the civil service behind them and play around with them then maybe but if it's all a bit last minute and we're really into the, the really late parts of the year before we get going with drafting and f tweaking legislation then it does seem a little less likely to me. And, and also, if it is, as I say, at the tail end of, of the year when they start getting going and, and actually working out what they're doing, April 2025 possibly seems a little bit early. And then are we looking more at 20? No, you think they'll get it through? I think they'll ram it through. They need the money. They're, they've said, Rachel Reeves has said, no ifs, no buts, everything will be costed. And I think that means we need the money, we're going to use the money, and, and that means to get the policies which will make them popular and, and especially in those first hundred days of office when they want to do stuff, they're going to need the money and delaying it by six months, a year won't work. So uh, my view is that they're going to ram it through however they need to. Fine. Okay. Thanks, Alison. Okay. So um, I think the other aspect just on that as well is um, you're going to have people that have been resident in the UK already and potentially have been resident in the UK for four years or more, and so will immediately become subject to um, UK income tax, capital gains tax, and inheritance tax on their worldwide estate, and they might look to leave. But if you're in that situation, again, you've got this 10-year tail, so leaving isn't necessarily the end of the story. Um, and again, I think that's that's something that... I'll very much hand over to Steve on to talk about how life assurance can help, but that's that's another example of where it can be particularly useful. So, and the life assurance piece is that with all this uncertainty, this is an option that you can apply to you know, day or at least a little bit of certainty whilst for a short or actually quite long period of time, depending on what the rule changes are. Yeah, yeah exactly. So my experience since the budget was that the phone got extremely hot when the Conservatives announced that they were going to sort of steal the non-DOM rule change from Labour. And then it got even hotter when Labour came out and said, we're doubling down on this. And so we ended up doing a hell of a lot of quotes in a very short space of time. And we were being asked a lot for 10 years, 15 years, 20 year term policies, often on a joint life, second death basis or, or single life, depending. Uh, because people were thinking, right, I need to consider this 10-year tail that, that, that could be coming in and say, so how long do I need? And what I'm, I'm sure you you guys as well have, have all seen this. A lot of people have already said, I'm off, I'm leaving, and they're just going. But then anyone that wants to stay for various reasons, family reasons, whatever it is, 
They're saying, right, I'm going to be here. My kids are this age. I'm going to be here till this till this point for sure. And after that, I'm probably going to go. So that date is maybe in 10 years' time. So I'll do a 20-year term policy. So we had a flurry of activity, did loads of quotes, put loads out there. And then it, and then they called the election. And actually, I was with their solicitor yesterday, uh, who was in one of the sessions where they were actually feeding back to government on, on the proposals. When they announced the election, everyone's phone started pinging while, while he was in the room. And literally, they said, "Well, let's just, let's go. Let's call a horses meeting." And they cancelled the next one. So all bets then are off. And actually, if the, all those quote requests stopped as well, pretty much. So it's gone it's gone quiet again until the election, which is understandable because if you're talking about entering into a process of getting medicals done and doing a load of work and spending a lot of money. Then you might as well wait and see who gets in and see what the rules might look like. But I think the general feeling is if Labour gets in, you might as well get going immediately because this is not going away. So it's so if Labour get in, we're going to get very busy. And I was out with um, a lot of solicitors and counsellors last night at an event, and everyone was saying you're going to get very busy because there's nothing else you can do on, on the inheritance tax side. If Labour do what they propose they're going to do, which is hit the UK residents on as they are, but even potentially hit their excluded property trusts uh, or set of included trusts as well, then the only thing that they can that's left to do if they want to stay is, is life insurance to cover that tail. And in that interim period, when we were getting all the quote requests, I must have had 10, 20 phone calls from people saying, what's the maximum cover you can get? Because there are clients that have got an awful lot of money out there. So and it's roughly 100, 100 million-ish, uh, maybe a bit more if you push it. So anyone that's worth more than 250 million, they're going to end up being just stuck. They're probably going to have to leave. And anecdotally, I was with a, a law firm and they said that 5% of their entire client book have already said they're leaving. Um, and it's the wrong 5%, it's the wealthiest 5% in the main that are going to go. Mm. So you know, this is this is dramatic, but there is a solution. But the solution obviously won't be for everyone, because if someone's not in good health, then they can't have it anyway. So this is, you have to manage it in terms of um, how much it's going to cost them, what age they are, and, and, and how we do it. But typically, the shorter the term, the cheaper it is. And... We can we can solve the problem to an extent. A couple of questions for you. Um, well, how long does it take to actually get these things set up? Generally, yeah, straightforward cases. How easy is it to get hold of? Uh, you know, in a, in a general sense. Um, and I know the interest rates has had an impact on the, the premiums, which could affect like do you wait or do you go? Um, and also, a lot of these people, um, or, or if you are non-res and you try to uh, uh, get a policy for assets here. Is that possible? Who would you go to? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, so taking them in turn, how long does it take? And that sort of bring, brings me into the process. So we, we unusually in Salus as a, as a pure life insurance broker business, we don't let the insurers have access to the clients at any stage of the process till the very end. So so we actually arrange the client's medicals. In most cases, we pay for the client's medicals before they do anything. And then we collate the data, we package it, and then we negotiate with the insurers and then get the firm offer for the, for the clients. And then we tell the client what that offer is, and then they go ahead or they don't. Um, what that means is that you don't have the, the jeopardy of applying to one insurance company that happens to be the cheapest and then the process not going well or them coming up with an unfair rating depending on the age or, or and the um, health of the client. So it means that we can go around the whole market, the, the insurer and reassurer market, to get the best price that's possible before the client gets pushed to and fro different insurers trying to negotiate that way. So that makes the process quicker because if, if a client does go through the old-fashioned process of going straight to the insurer, getting a bad decision, you go back to square one to go back to the next insurer, and it can take an awfully long time. And when you're dealing with high levels of life cover, that is more likely to happen, and that's that's why this process was was created, really. Um, so in a, in a standard situation, how long do we predict? It all depends on the client's 
own GP. So if they're, so if they're UK resident and they have an NHS GP, then we have to get their GP medical record. And that is the, the bit that takes the time. So let's say on average, we're looking at a month to, to two months for that. That means to get the record. Yeah. And that that's how long the process is. So if we get that record within a month, we'd have done the medicals already in most cases, and then we'll be we'll be on risk within two months. And normally so two months, additional four months in total. No, 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 two months in total. So okay. the, the medical record is the thing that creates the time. Right. Okay. Everything, everything else we can do quickly. It's just that. So it depends on your GP, one to two months. You'll yeah. get you do one set of medicals that can be applied to all the different insurance. Exactly. Although there is there is often medical complexity, and sometimes things come up on the medical, which means you've got to manage it. Right. So if anything happens whereby the clients have to go and get extra treatment, then that pushes you back till that treatment's done. Like mm-hmm. A, a urine infection. I mean, right. I mean, we wouldn't believe post COVID. I would say half the clients we saw had urine infections. It was unbelievable, and so no one would offer cover until they'd had their course of antibiotics and they sorted out. Yeah. And it was just a nightmare. It's like, oh no, not another one. It's just, it's just such a pain. You become that. an expert. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, exactly. Yeah, but that's just one thing. And there's so many other potential things. But that's that's a, that was an odd. But seemingly not happening anymore. So I don't know what that was at that period of time. But that's that problem's gone away. But the the other thing that's a pain is the exercise ECG, because there's oh, all sorry. an exercise ECG, so an electrocardiogram, where where they they put you on a treadmill mm-hmm. and monitor your heart function, and they often throw up false negatives, which then oh, yeah. needs to be investigated, which takes time. But so we try to manage the process whereby we don't use insurers that want one. Okay. Because a lot of insurers have pushed the the, the amount of cover you need to, to, to have to have one up. Mm-hmm. So sometimes we'll actually split between three insurers to get below that line just, just to avoid that because it's a pain. Okay. Presumably, though, because you can control the medical data that you're getting, you know which insurers to go to if there are certain conditions. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So but yeah, some, some insurers don't like certain things, like, say, Zurich don't like high alcohol consumption. And for them, they might say anything above, say, 25, whereas others would say anything above 25 units a week. But yeah, it's, it, they, they all have this. You know, Start talking about going there. Yeah. yeah. But, but we know how to manage it anyway. And also we do talk to the clients about how, you know, don't, don't just blurt out how many units you've had in the last week. Think a bit more deeply about what your average intake is and be, you know, be... Sensible, sensible, yes. uh, and and so uh, okay. How many how many people can't get cover who don't have horrific illnesses, or are they pretty much coverable? You just have to hunt around. No, anyone that's in reasonably good health is coverable. Uh, we we often have um, people who have had cancer and they've recovered, and it's ten years on, and they're coverable. It's not a problem. Um, we often, I mean, this is we we often have clients who we quote for, and then they go quiet. And then two years later, they come back to us saying, I really, really want cover and they're dead keen. And you find out they've had cancer in the meantime. So right. that, that means that they, they have to then wait five years post being clear of cancer to be insurable. And even then, possibly with quite a high temporary loading. So, okay. um, and yeah, we, we often get clients who are very slow. So I say one to two months, that's if the clients are keen to get moving and willing to actually go with us yes. on this. Yeah, yeah. So if the clients like take three months to fill in our forms, then it's going to take an extra three months till we get the forms filled out. So. I, I think we're all sp- we're, we're 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 in a safe space here. I think <laughs> we all understand that. Yeah, angry, are they? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Next one is uh, okay. Interest rates are higher than they've been for a while. What's the impact on premiums? Like, like can you give some examples of of yeah. a million pounds worth of cover now versus two years ago? Yeah. So. But for term assurance, mostly interest rates don't really make much of a difference. So for, for these UK resident on looking at term policies, it, the price will go up with age gradually, but it won't change that much based on interest rates. Interest rates have affected guaranteed whole of life policies massively since the Russian Ukrainian invasion. Because when interest rates went up fast, prices came down fast. So actually, the I mean, one thing that went from practically nothing up to about five percent, but that, but that that caused a twenty percent drop across the board in pricing. So, and we were offering guaranteed whole life and placing it for quite a lot of clients prior to the um, Ukraine invasion. 
And so we took all of those policies and rewrote them because it just made no sense not to. If it's the same, if, although you were two years on, so the clients were two years older on, on that start, side of the pricing, the price had come down so much that everyone managed to shave 10, 15, up to 20% of, their, of the prices. So just when we're, we're talking about guaranteed whole of life as, as opposed to term assurance, it might be a good idea just to explain how guaranteed whole of life works. Yep. So it's, it, so guaranteed whole of life is it's exactly that. It, it lasts forever. So it's like term assurance. There's no value in it. It's pure insurance, but it never ends. So you know there's going to be a payout provided you maintain the premiums to the end. Um, and because of that, you can model it as an investment and, and you're allowed to call it guaranteed legally because it does have the FSCS backing um, up to 100% of the sum assured. So it's uh, it's it essentially is an investment product, but you have to maintain premiums. Because of that, you can say, okay, it cost me £10,000 for a million cover and I'm age 50. So, okay, so let's say, take the, let's, let's choose an end date where a, a sort of theoretical date when I'm like, die, that might be age 90, you can model it and say, okay, if I were to save that £10,000 per annum instead, what growth rate would I need on that to hit the million at age 90? And you can see whether it's a good deal or not. Um, and so with, with all the clients that we discuss guaranteed whole of life with, we go through the, the maths of it to, to judge whether it's a good deal or not. And Mostly, I sub at age 50, it's not a good deal because it, just, it doesn't work. Because the, compound, the way compound interest works, you're better off investing the money. But anyone over 50, and the older and older you get, the better the numbers come out. And so if, if you get a, a couple in good health in their late 60s, early 70s, you could be looking at having needed way more than 10% per annum of risk-free growth on the assets had you saved them instead. So it's just a, it's a neat investment product. Yeah. But oh, no, no, five. Five. Okay. Yeah. More, more importantly, it delivers money to the family separate to probate when they need it. And so it's about creating the actual outcome that they need. Because what, what they're worried about is that on the, on the death of, of the person or the couple or the, the second to die of the couple, probate is needed and there's a load of liquid assets and it's going to be a nightmare. But to have some money, maybe not the whole IHT liability, but just some to see them through that period of time until they can get through the probate process is invaluable. So that's that's normally what we use it for. So uh, you've got someone who is gone, that's it. I'm, I'm leaving the country because you guys can organise or whatever. Um, I'm leaving. Uh, one of the things that came up when we were talking about it is it's actually really hard to get life insurance for assets or for people when they go uh, non resident, yeah, yeah. And so, not, so, so your advice is, yeah, I mean, do, do it before you go now because the, it's just got a lot harder. So, two weeks ago, um, AIG, who were the only UK based insurer who were sort of offering cover to non UK residents fairly easily, pulled the plug completely. They got, they got bought by Aviva, and Aviva said, right, no more non resident, we're not honoring the pipeline absolutely nothing and so the market has just collapsed for non-UK residents in terms of offering straightforward UK-based term insurance and things like that so and that's it too. Uh, if they sign up on Monday but then they and they get sign you know they get cover on Monday and they leave on Tuesday is that cover still sitting in place it's better to have a bit of time uh, uh, sorry yeah okay it doesn't have to be the next day yeah, yeah. If, if they, they... a few months would be fine but if, if, if you know you basically if you if you if you've got your flight booked you have to tell them that you're okay. going and some insurers won't like that some wouldn't mind so it's, it's about us then knowing which ones will actually use. so it's literally if you are already organized to go yeah because i'm assuming if you have already organized to go and you don't tell them and they find out they'll go we're not having you because you didn't inform yeah. us where so it's get it get it this organized before you get the movement exactly so yeah go go soon as possible if you're thinking you might go uh if you have made the decision to go and you do have that date still speak to us because we will disclose that to the insurers and find out which ones are still happy it's only about the legality of solicitation and around you know are you uk resident today yes right. okay we'll take that but but some insurers don't like it so they'll just say well no they know they're going that's not one for us so we can manage it. 
Okay. So, yeah. but equally, that's that's an issue for non-UK residents who've never had any real connection with the UK, other than having maybe purchased a, a rental property or a holiday home or something like that. Um, yeah. They've got an IHT liability on that property, um, and they may not be able to obtain cover. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. But, um, oh, sorry, I've got, yeah. got a question. Yeah. Sorry, someone has asked a question. I haven't seen it. Um, so, Lewis Amato, thank you for the question. Does a client moving abroad have any effect on their life insurance if they become a not our? Oh, sorry, that was the question. Yeah, so, so, so essentially, no. Once, no. once you've got your contract, you've got your contract, so you can move afterwards. But you should tell the insurer if you have moved. Right. They just like to know. Fair. Then, yeah, that's fair enough. Um, if, if the client dies in a really weird place, like deepest, darkest jungle uh, in Africa, and there's no proper death certificate, then you've got a problem. So you have to prove death somehow, but that's something that we help manage. But yeah. Uh, right. So we have quite a few, unsurprisingly, tax advisors on the call today. David, I can just about see your face now. Uh, so guys, are you coming across? Is this, <laughs> is this being discussed? Uh, 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 is this on your radar? Is this on clients' radars? It, what... Um, What's uh, uh, right, Andy, Andy? As you mentioned, mate. So, so I think, yeah. I mean, I think life assurance has been on the agenda for quite a while. Not least because, in a short term, certainly talking about term assurance. Term assurance is very reasonably priced compared to the price of an offshore trust company, for instance. So, so actually, we for quite a long time have been considering it as an alternative to setting up an excluded property trust in circumstances where it's relatively obvious that the client is going to leave. Yeah. Obviously, it, 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 the whole of life, guaranteed whole of life, is a different ballgame. Yeah. Um, but so, so it has been on the agenda for quite a long time, and I think going forward will become increasingly more important. Thank you, David. Anyone else got any, uh, any feedback? Sarah, so, Sarah you've been very quiet. Me? How are you doing? Me? Yeah, I was just saying you've been very quiet. I know it makes a change. I don't I don't do I'm interested in this stuff, but it's not what I do. Yeah, okay. I don't deal with individuals, I deal with trusts, so mm -hmm. yeah. and nothing nothing foreign, no foreign content. Too <laughs> specialist for me. <laughs> Fair enough. Good. Um any other questions? As because I, I think we, we, from what we wanted to cover today, if that was useful, that was kind of what I wanted to do: outline what we've got, what we might have, and some of the little nuances of life cover. If anyone has any other questions about nuances, or if they've had an experience where something's not quite worked out and they weren't sure why, now's a good time to raise it. Um, but I will be sending an email with uh, with um, Adrian and, and 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 Steve's details on anyway. If you don't want to follow up and have a conversation. Yeah. No, that was really helpful. No, no extra questions from me, but I think it was really interesting to hear how important the timing is with um, when somebody is thinking of leaving, as some of our clients will be looking to do, to go, right, actually, life cover is, is one of the really earliest things they need to be thinking about. Is, is, Thank you. Yeah, is, is, sorry, is there any disadvantage? I mean, you say that now, you know, AIG are taken over by Viva and wait right for non-residents. Is there any disadvantage to somebody who is does go non-resident is it a disadvantage to have a policy with some non-uk insurer or, or does it does it really make a difference or is it just so you, if you, if you, you obviously wouldn't be able to help them with it but yeah if you, if you go outside the uk market you're, you're going to almost certainly have to have a dollar based policy and, and normally you go to probably out of Bermuda for, for the US carriers and, and they're just different types of policies. So they normally carry some investment risk. Right. But on the flip side, that probably makes them cheaper because, because there's some risk in there, it makes them a bit cheaper. So and, and, and often they're structured as single premiums or on a shorter time frame for paying. Yeah. So it's just a very different animal. Yeah. But yeah. if you want cheap, simple, guaranteed pure life insurance, then they're, then they're, it's harder to get. I mean, we're, we're trying to get it now. So we're speaking to some, a carrier in Hong Kong, a carrier in Singapore, and I've got access to the US market by another sort of contact. But it's just so complicated and so hard 
And it's an, an actual fact. For pure, for pure cover, the UK was cheaper. Right. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. That's interesting. Thank you. Right, unless there's any other questions, we have gone over a little bit, but that was my fault because we didn't start until three minutes in. So, um, guys, thank you. A big thank you to Adrian and, and Steve in particular um, for coming in. Um, and I hope that was useful. I will send an email to everyone uh, on here just with, I say, with details. And if Steve's got anything interesting to, to, to send over and follow up with, I will attach that as well. So, have a lovely rest of your Friday, and uh, hopefully, I'll see you next month. Yes, thank you very much. Take care. Thanks.